Benefactor underwriting for this broadcast has been provided by a grant from Republic Bank, The Power of Red is Back. Major underwriting support for this broadcast has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Customers Bank, Collins Building Services, Marks Panic. Additional underwriting support has been provided by grants from Amtrust Title, Bank of America, Capital One Bank, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties LLC, Handler Real Estate Organization, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Kestmetidis Red Apple Group, New Banks, Meridian Capital Group, Ocean First Bank, RPW Group, TD Bank, The One Stop Property Group, and these friends. I still remember the date in December. Um, I think it was December 9th of 2001. I was taping uh, the Stoller Report at Shallot's Kosher Restaurant on 55th Street. And one of my guests was Jeff Levine. And so much has happened over the past 20 years. So I'm very happy to have a one-on-one -on -one with Jeff Levine to talk to me about the real estate market, his views on the world, and what it is. So Jeff, Let's talk about the evolution over the last 20 years, especially since you have two members of your family who were young members then who are actively involved in your business today. Obviously, you know, it's very funny that we're talking about December of 2001. Now, 20 years later, the 20 year um, memorial of the tragic events of 9 11. Um, and New York City has had uh, a number of ups and downs over the course of those 20 years. And if you're doing business in New York City, you had to ride those waves. Um, so riding waves, I guess I become a surfer because riding the waves is a very important aspect of staying afloat, if I can use another pun, um, in the New York City real estate market. You know, you mentioned that uh, back 20 years ago, uh, we had come from a uh, gala uh, for one of the, uh, I think it was New York City, um, New York State Affordable Housing Group, well, extensively the number of affordable housing developers. Many of us are still involved. And I was doing quite a bit of affordable housing in those days, which was for me very beneficial because uh, as you know, um, I started my business after I graduated City College of Architecture. I worked for a developer. Uh, I went into my own business at the age of 25 years old. I didn't have much, capital, but I had some chutzpah. And I did contracting for developers who were already working with city um, programs for affordable housing, um, such as the vacant building program and the participation loan program. And I became adept at the contracting of those buildings. And I then started to respond to RPs on my own account and became the developer in those projects. Um, along the way, I veer off. Um, after 9-11, frankly, I had a project, I think you may recall, uh, which we call the Cameo, it was my first market rate residential project up on 50th Street. And I was actually starting to rent up in the fourth quarter of, uh, tw of 2001. And I thought I was off service. I thought I would no way be renting apartments in that city at that time, where we had a psychology of fear uh, after those attacks and exodus of jobs seemed to be on the horizon. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, whether I was lucky, the city came back in a fantastic way. Actually, uh, Morgan Stanley bought a building from Lehman up on 50th and Broadway. And in a short time, in that fourth quarter of 01, I leased up my entire building, partially due to that, partially due to the fact that a number of residents who had been living downtown, the financial district, 
wanted to escape the toxicity which was apparent after the collapse of the Trade Center. And we rented up the building very quickly. I was able to refinance and my woes at the moment seems to be behind me. Uh, with that, I got a real a shot of adrenaline about the future of New York City. And I began to buy sites for development in a, a very uh, aggressive way. You may recall, it was shortly after that that I bought the piece of the waterfront in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, which we rezoned and developed over 2,500 units there over these last 20 years. We also made our first uh, foray into the, what is now called the Hudson Yards area, um, which uh, wasn't yet the Hudson Yards, which was basically the freight yards uh, where I used to actually load trucks as a kid while I was going to City College at night. And uh, I built the ohm in that aftermath. Um, and by the time I finished the ohm, we got caught in that second downdraft back in 2008 and 2009, the Lehman collapse. But again, better to be lucky than smart. Um, and uh, the bottom line is, even though rents plummeted as they did recently on uh, next uh, down cycle, the COVID-19 pandemic, rents plummeted, but interest rates also plummeted. And I like to say we made more money by accident than on purpose, because it would have been wonderful had we hit our target rents, but we didn't. Um, but the debt service, because of uh, the Fed controlling course of interest rates to bring that to the economy after the tragic events in 9-11 uh, was basically free money and has continued to be so, which has been a boon, of course, as you and I know, to the real estate business, but it also can be a burden going forward. You know, you bring up two things. You talk about Williamsburg, which I want you to continue to talk about, and I also want you to talk about the, the Hudson Yards, because when you created or building the own, many people said, is he out of his mind? It was an area that nobody was there. There was no related. There was no shopping center. There was nothing. So, so no today, high line. <laughs> no high line and everything. Let's talk about what's your thoughts today of the far west side, that neighborhood and so on. And where do you think the opportunities? And then I'd really like you to discuss Williamsburg and Greenpoint. Okay. Two other areas that you've been involved. You've been involved with more. Absolutely. Um, as you know, um, Demographics has always been an extremely important part of the real estate business. You know, we're baby boomers and the baby boomers has been described as what the pig, the python, I think it is. And the reality is that our housing needs, our shopping needs, our uh, social needs have kind of dictated the economy for the past uh, 40 years or 50 years. Um, there's a new generation today, uh, you know, where the, the millennials, which I guess would be referred to as Gen X, um, they are beginning to, I think they've actually started to outnumber the, uh, the baby boom generation and their needs for housing are different than ours was. Um, when I went to the Hudson Yards, you know, back at the time of uh, 2008 and well, starting seven, delivered a nine, I went there because I had been building very successfully um, in the West Chelsea area. And while that area is now known as the Hudson Yards, West Chelsea and the West Side pretty much moves up to theirs. So I think I would consider 34th Street to be the demarcation, demarcation point of, of what is the end of West Chelsea. And I had been very successful, if you remember, going back to uh, post 01, I bought a piece um, that had actually fallen into distress at uh, 23rd Street. We did a very successful condo there, which- I'll Which you started as a rental, if I remember. We did it as a rental, um, and uh, we flipped the switch to turn it into a condo um, because the market had caught fire up until obviously that uh, debacle of 2007 and eight, but we very successfully delivered that job through 05 and 06. I, I love that West Chelsea market. I saw that the galleries were moving north from 23rd Street up to the 30s. And I saw it as an opportunity to strike uh, that same uh, demographic, that next generation millennials who wants to be in Manhattan, who loves what West Chelsea meatpacking district had to offer in the way of social amenities, uh, you know, dining selections, galleries, the work. So, you know, now that section of Hudson Yards with the advent of 
you know, uh, related to this magnificent project um, has really taken off. Um, you know, we suffered greatly through COVID in as much as many people when the leases were expiring, chose to vacate their premises and move uh, either to summer houses or summer rentals or parents' houses um, to work remotely. But I have to tell you, since the vaccine uh, came onto the scene, we've seen a resurgence of rentals like I've never seen before. Um, we're huge, getting huge increases in our rents. Uh, our occupancy in uh, the Hudson Yards area, which had fallen uh, to less than 80% as the virus was at its peak, and that would essentially be in the third and fourth quarters of 20. Uh, once we turned the corner into 21 and we had the vaccine, uh, we're 100% occupied at rents higher than we've ever seen before. So New York is, where rentals are concerned, absolutely coming back with a vengeance. Um, Aren't you building something now in Hell's Kitchen? Well, yeah, our, our experience in West Chelsea slash Hudson Yards, um, uh, our success there motivated us to make another deal with the family uh, of the property that we did the home on 30th Street. We have an entire block front on 29th Street from to, on 11th Avenue from 29th to 30th Street, where we're building a 60-story, uh, approximately 1 million square foot, 940 affordable New York State tax abated um, mixed income apartment building with uh, I believe 30% affordable units. And we're very excited about the prospects there because as I'm sure you know, and you have, uh, you know, the uh, Farley Post Office, which is going to get Facebook, as we understand. And, you know, Amazon is talking about renting more space. I believe that you have almost 20 million square feet of Class A office space, leased to AAA tenants, you know, like Wells Fargo, like Coach, all within short walking distance of our soon-to-be-completed West 29th Street property, our already operating 30th Street property, and uh, where I believe that in this post-pandemic environment where commutation has become certainly in the short term more difficult because people are hesitant to take public transportation, um, more cars on the road, congestion has become a problem. I think we'll start to see congestion pricing in New York City very soon as well. All of that means that being within walking distance to all of those jobs will be of great value coming these next few years. You've been involved with affordable housing for many years. How has the affordable housing changed in New York? And how do you see with the new changes in administration, the affordable housing effect in New York City? Well, affordable housing has evolved over the years from initially um, being uh, focused on uh, low income and moderate income renters. There still is a focus, although Community seem to be want to focus today more on the low and extremely low income categories, because as you know, uh, we've had certainly during this pandemic in these last few years, a serious problem with the homeless community here in New York City. And we are working with a number of not-for-profits and um, social service organization, be it FIPS houses or Breaking Ground or uh, Catholic Charities to bring both supportive and social service uh, to these properties for those people who need help getting back on their feet. So the, the HBD is doing a great job for our society, HDC as well. I think you may know that our organization recently was fortunate enough to be designated a project known as Vital Brooklyn over the Kingsborough Psychiatric Facility in Brooklyn. And we're working with the state right now to build a large number, the project is over a million square feet, a large number of both supportive and shelter housing in association with services, in that case, with Breaking Ground. We've partnered with Elizabeth Les of the Les organization, and we're very excited about that project coming up. And with the baby boomer, one area that you were involved with heavily 25 years ago and continually be involved with is the senior housing. Let's talk about your thoughts on senior housing. Well, you know, senior housing is a good business in that there are high barriers to entry. Um, you know, senior housing is uh, both uh, housing, it's hospitality, because as you know, both housekeeping and dining services are 
a part of it. And of course, it's healthcare, where depending upon the level of service, be it independent, assisted, or memory care, there is a, a healthcare component as well. So that means a large number of employees. It means, you know, having to have the mass to do it effectively, affordably, and properly. Um, in New York, as you remember, years ago, we built the, the two largest independent assisted living facilities with Atria, one in Kew Gardens, one in Riverdale. At some point, we sold out to Atria, who continued to own and operate those facilities. And we went into the business in a much bigger way out in uh, the Arizona area, where we have an office and we have been building independent assisted living continuously for the past uh, 25 years. In New York, we continue to build senior housing, typically um, in association with state programs like the SARA and the city programs that uh, provide Section 8 vouchers to build housing, not so much with health services, um, but with social services. Let's talk about your thoughts about Staten Island and the Bronx. The Bronx you've been into for many, many years. Well, we've been all boroughs. As you know, my office uh, initially was in Queens, and we had our development office here in um, Manhattan. And I think you know that um, we're currently also involved with the New York City Housing Authority. We were designated uh, the development through a lease and a partnership with NYCHA of the Linden Houses, which I'm very proud to be a part of because, as you may recall, I lived at the Linden Houses uh, as a child in Brooklyn, and uh, I'm thrilled to be associated with its uh, renovation and it's being brought up to speed to be a quality housing for the next generation. Um, Staten Island, we have worked through the years. Uh, we actually, in addition to building the Staten Island Jewish Community Center, we built a, an independent assisted living in association with Metropolitan Council of Jewish Poverty in Seaview. And then we also built, under the SARA program, a seniors facility there. We actually uh, have recently submitted, along with uh, you know, Monsignor Sullivan and Catholic Charities to uh, provide services in partnership with us to do the Stapleton project, which is in Staten Island as well. So we're very excited about working in all five of the boroughs of New York City. Let's talk about the evolution of Williamsburg. From the beginning, your involvement to the current day in Williamsburg. My father actually was born and raised as a child in Williamsburg, may he rest in peace. And um, when I went there, he thought I was crazy. Uh, but as you know, I had also been involved building in Williamsburg with the New York City Housing Partnership uh, back in the early days. Um, I was therefore very familiar with what was going on in Williamsburg. Williamsburg had always been a bedroom community for those immigrants who were living in the more affordable areas of Williamsburg and Greenpoint um, and working essentially in Manhattan, whether it be as building maintenance workers, rest or whatever the case may be. Um, so there was always a housing stock there. Um, there were always buildings that were suitable for renovation and occupation by the next generation of young people. And we saw that, and you may recall, that the waterfront in Brooklyn for many years was a, an abandoned, uh, really a waste uh, garbage uh, handling facility. I believe it was waste management that was operating it. And the people in the community established something called NAG, I think it was Neighborhood Against Garbage, Neighbors Against Garbage. Um, they wanted to get rid of the recycling facilities that cluttered up the waterfront over in North 5th, 6th, and 7th Street, east of Kent onto the river. They would have liked to have seen parks, um, but the city under the Bloomberg administration uh, saw very clearly that one way to get out of a housing crisis was to build housing. Uh, they developed what was called the inclusionary, the, the voluntary inclusionary zoning bonus program. We were more or less a pilot for that. And we built on the waterfront, um, building affordable housing for the community, in addition to um, market rate for sale housing, as well as rental housing. And uh, we were very successful. The community loved what we did there. They did get, the city did condemn a portion of the property to create a legacy park. So I think a very good compromise was struck there, which allowed the community to get to some degree what it wanted and the city to get the benefit 
of both more market rate housing, which was highly in demand, as well as affordable housing. Let's talk a little bit about the hospitality market. You've been, you, as we said, you've been in the hospitality market and the seniors. Let's talk about the regular hotel market because you were involved also going back to the, the initial Gansvort. Yes, as you know, I built the first Gansvort meatpacking as a contractor. Um, by the time the meatpacking in uh, Park Avenue, excuse me, the Gansvort in Park Avenue was uh, going to be built, I no longer did third party construction, but I had forged a great relationship with the Ackermounts and we uh, negotiated a partnership and I, we built a project together. Um, and we also did another project in Shoreditch in London, my first overseas project where we built something called the Curtain um, in the Shoreditch section, which uh, bears some similarity to kind of meatpacking slash Lower East Side is where, where all the hipsters were. It's where all the techies went. And both of those projects were very successful. Um, fortunately for me, uh, I sold out one through a buy sell and the other through a sale lease back uh, prior to COVID. So needless to say, anybody who's in the hospitality knows that um, the pandemic has been what I guess I'd call a category killer for the hospitality business. But in general, I've lost my flavor, so to speak, for hospitality, not so much because of the, the cycles that we've experienced, but frankly speaking, I think technology has made it very difficult, in my opinion, to be in the commodity hotel business. Uh, the reality is that anybody can go online and they can book an Airbnb, they can look at Hotel Tonight, they can look at Kayak, they can look at anyone, Travelocity, Priceline.com, and they can find a room that is as cheap as humanly possible in a moment's notice. So when you're facing a system like that, I don't think there's a lot of room for price power. There is a market that I think has life, which is the luxury hotel market, you know, products like um, Four Seasons. And I see Bill Gates just bought the balance of the Four Seasons. So I guess my thinking must be in line with his, uh, but the Amman Hotel, you know, some of these higher end luxury brands where people who have more disposable income or making decisions based upon wants rather than financial needs, I think that's an area where there may continue to be opportunity, but it's not something that I have an appetite for. Young people come to you. What do you tell them? Where are the opportunities today, especially in light of COVID, in light of people working from the home? Where are the opportunities in real estate for a young person? You know, it's really, I tell young people uh, who want to be in real estate, um, two things, that real estate is a very cyclical business. When the economy is good and people need offices and people need homes and people need apartments and people need retail, there's lots of business and everybody is busy and everybody can make a buck. On the other hand, when things go bad, there's no place to hide because if there's a, a glut of office space, nobody's building the office space. Even as we speak right here in New York, as you know, We've just gone through a retail apocalypse, as they've called it. We're also seeing a, a glut of office space. I think vacancy in New York is up to like 18%. I don't anticipate, and obviously the condo market had an abundance of product and uh, is taking a very long time to sell out at far more modest prices than people had hoped they would sell out for. Even though there's more activity, it's pent up activity as a result of people being unable to go out and purchase units as a result of the pandemic. So um, I'd be very concerned about the cycles. I said, if you don't have the stomach to endure the ups and downs of uh, the loss of income, I would consider another industry. That's the first thing I tell everybody. You have to have the ability to uh, take the aggravation of a cyclical market. And the next question is, well, you know, would I tell young people to go to places where you have uh, the magic uh, you know, ingredients, which is growth. Yes. I mean, the reality is, you know, the good news is you see New York over the last decade has grown, uh, I think, uh, four or 500,000 people from 8 million to 8 million six. That's positive. Um, but there are other areas where there is even more significant population growth, be it down in the Southeast and the Carolinas or out in the, um, you know, the Phoenix area where there's huge population growth, where there's population growth, there's always need and demand. So I 
Those would be my first two. Now, obviously, for myself, look, my children, as you know, Benjamin and Jessica are in the business with me. Jessica primarily working in our affordable portfolio, Ben on the market rate. Um, I don't want them moving away from me. Unfortunately for me, I've sustained myself through these cycles, and we can afford to stay here until the market comes back. That's not to say we aren't doing business because we are also building, um, we're going through zoning to build a new multifamily building over in North Scottsdale in Phoenix. And we actually own a piece of property in Peoria where we're going through the approval process that's already zoned to build a, uh, what you and I might call from New York Garden Apartments, two story buildings on a 16 acre site, probably about 250 units all in, um, which we're, already talking, we haven't even gotten our permits yet. Taiwan Semiconductor is building in excess of, I don't know, 5 million square feet of facilities to produce semiconductors out there because the government out there in Phoenix in uh, the town of Peoria, actually this is in Phoenix, the facility, has a very accommodating attitude towards uh, that kind of growth. So Jeff, we've been together many times with many shows, with many discussions, We've both seen the ups and downs, and I'm very happy that you joined me today on this special edition of the Stoller Report. Wishing you and your family a wonderful new year, happy and a healthy new year. Regards to everyone, and see you soon. Thanks again. Oh, always a pleasure to speak to you. Feel well.